it's a pleasure to be here. I feel this is very strange, as for most of us, we're not used to doing in-person events, things like this, coming to them. I've only been to one uh, before this in the last two years. I'm probably a different person than I was in early 2020. But I don't feel that way. It feels that there's a continuous essence of me that's persisted from then until now. Would I have noticed the change? Probably not. There could be something going on, like self-change blindness. The experience of being me changes, but I don't perceive the change. And this is an argument that I want to leave you with at the end of this talk. And I actually think it's fundamental for understanding consciousness of self and consciousness of the world. In fact, evolution has designed us to perceive, our, to perceive ourselves as more stable than we actually are, because all of perception is geared towards keeping ourselves alive, towards regulating the body, making sure we stay alive. We perceive the world around us and ourselves within it with, through, and because of our living bodies. That's the kind of take-home message before we get started. That's the argument I make in, in the book. Now, thinking of things this way brings up this, puts, brings up this issue of consciousness, of course. This is an issue that's on the table immediately. What is consciousness? Can we explain it scientifically? Will it always escape scientific methods? And so on. And the definition of consciousness that I like to start with has to do with the philosopher Thomas Nagel. Now, Thomas Nagel, he says it very simply, really, and this goes back to the 1970s. He says that an organism has conscious mental states if, and only if, there is something it is like to be that organism. Now, there's something it's like to be me, there's something it's like to be you, there's probably something it's like to be an elephant or a tiger or a kangaroo. There is probably nothing it is like to be a table or an iPhone or a glass of water or a simple robot these days. There's nothing going on for that system. There's no inner universe. This could be a, a very circular definition of consciousness, but it at least gets us on the same page. Consciousness is what goes away when we fall asleep into a dreamless state or Indeed, probably more, more true to say, what goes away under general anesthesia and what comes back when we come around or wake up. It is not the same thing as intelligence. We don't have to be smart to suffer. It is not the same thing as the ability to generate complex behavior. It's certainly not the same thing as having language, although we humans use language to talk about consciousness. So consciousness fundamentally is any kind of conscious experience um, whatsoever. Which means that, of course, there are other things that can have conscious experiences. Nagel's paper is well known for its title more than anything, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? There's something going on for the bat that makes it like something to be that bat. We will never be able to experience batness for ourselves, but that's because we're not bats. Now, there's another inner universe for bats going on. But can science explain consciousness? On the face of it, it seems that it might not be able to. On the one hand, we have things that are made of stuff, whether they're tables or chairs or brains and bodies. Descartes called this uh, res extensa, the world of the material. And then on the other hand, we have conscious experiences, the experience of redness, the, experience, the sharpness of a pain or the pang of jealousy. Now, these mental states don't seem to be the same kind of thing that mechanisms can explain. Descartes divided the universe this way. His basic insight has been repeated many times over the years. David Chalmers very famously talks about the hard problem of consciousness. He says, it is widely agreed that experience arises from a physical basis, but we have no good explanation of why and how it so arises. Why should physical processing give rise to a rich inner life at all? It seems objectively unreasonable that it should, and yet it does. We are conscious. This seems to be a very, very difficult problem indeed. And in the face of this apparent challenge, there are all sorts of of ways of thinking that are on the menu, and we'll hear about some of these other parts of this festival. One of them is, is panpsychism. Consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous. It is in some sense everywhere and in everything. This sort of explains away the hard problem, because if consciousness is fundamental and ubiquitous, you no longer have to explain how it comes to be for certain physical uh, systems. Now, the problem with panpsychism is not that it sounds crazy, it's just that it's not testable, it doesn't lead to any testable propositions and doesn't explain anything, which is a problem. Another idea out there is that we're mistaken that there's such a thing as a hard problem or that our conscious experience exists in the way that we tend to think of them. That it's really just the operation of complex mechanisms 
and the idea that conscious experiences, that there really is a redness to red as we experience it, that's somehow an illusion. Now I think this is a very, it's like a powerful medicine. You take a little bit of this, it's very useful because it inoculates us against taking how things seem as an insight into how they actually are. You take too much of it and I think you end up uh, going off the rails in saying that consciousness doesn't exist. In fact, consciousness is the only thing we can be really sure of. It's without consciousness, there's no world, there's no self, there's nothing at all. And this, this perspective is often called illusionism. Now, trying to navigate between these two extremes is challenging, but that's you know, what I've been trying to do over the years in an approach that I, you know, with tongue-in-cheek, called the real problem of consciousness. And the real problem of consciousness is not the hard problem of figuring out how and why it's part of the universe in the first place, the Chalmers problem. It's how can mechanisms and processes in the brain and body explain, predict, and control properties of consciousness. Whether they are functional, like what can we do because we're conscious? I can do many things when I experience a glass of water, I can pick it up and drink from it, throw it around, um, talk to it, I can do many things. But critically phenomenological, and that's the unfortunately too many syllable word, uh, to mean the experiential character of a conscious experience. Visual experiences have a particular feeling. Now they're in space, they're objects and people and spaces in between them. Emotional experiences have a different character. Experiences of free will have a different character. Again, if we can understand these differences, instead of treating consciousness as one big scary mystery, we start chipping away at that mystery and doing what science has always done, explaining, predicting when things happen and being able to control things as they appear. We control, we can, if we can do that, we're constructing a real science of consciousness. It's neither the hard problem, because I'm not trying to say what is the magic special source that magics consciousness from mere mechanism, and it's not the so-called easy problems of, con uh, of, of neuroscience, which is basically everything about the brain that doesn't involve consciousness at all. No, we're trying to say these are the properties of consciousness, how do they relate to underlying mechanisms? I'm certainly not the first person to propose this approach, there are many precedents and things like neurophenomenology and, and so on. But the underlying feeling is, instead of solving this hard problem, we'll dissolve it. And there's a historical precedent for thinking this way. The parallel isn't complete, but it's illuminating and illustrative. 150 years ago, people thought that life could never be explained in terms of mechanisms. That maybe we needed to find some elan vital, some spark of life, some special source. And of course, if you treat life as one big scary mystery, that's the temptation. But biologists ended up explaining different properties of living systems by different mechanisms in physics and chemistry, and the hard problem of life was dissolved, was not solved. Now, consciousness is not the same thing as life. There are many differences. The point is that what seems mysterious from one particular point with the concepts and tools that you have may not always seem mysterious. For me, this is the way to understand consciousness, to isolate its properties and account for them. So what are the properties of consciousness? Well. In the book and in my work with my lab, we divide it into three ways, more or less. There's conscious level, how conscious you are at any particular time, the difference between anesthesia and normal conscious wakefulness, or other states like the psychedelic state, minimally conscious state. There's conscious content, what we are conscious of when we are conscious. All the objects, people, places, colors, shapes that populate our experience of the world around us. And then an important subset of that, is self, the experience of being a self. The self isn't the thing that does the experiencing, the self arises in experience too. And that is a critical part of what being consciousness is all about, and it's probably the aspect of consciousness that each of us clings to most tightly in different ways. The brain is a prediction machine, and that everything that we perceive, everything that we experience, everything that we do is a kind of brain-based prediction. Now just think about what it means to be a brain for a minute. And let's take perception as this task of figuring out what's out there in the world. There you are, you're your brain, you're locked inside this bony skull. It's dark in there, it's silent. All you've got to go on as a brain are streams of electrical signals which are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they may be. And from these noisy, ambiguous, uncertain electrical signals the brain conjures forth a world full of things with positions and, and properties. How does it do that? 
The idea, and this is an idea that goes way back in science and in philosophy, is that it's a process of inference of some kind. So by inference, I just mean the brain is making its best guess about what's out there based on inherently uncertain, noisy, ambiguous data. The brain is combining its expectations, expectations that you're not personally aware of having that can be built deep into the circuitry of the brain, like that light comes from above. Expectations combines those with sensory data, and then what you perceive, this is the hypothesis, is the content of the brain's predictions. It's not a readout of the sensory data. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.